Solutions uh, Supply Chain Management Program. Before joining Clear Ballot, Ed held senior operation positions at the and an MBA from the University of Phoenix. And to his right, to his left, is Ed Pearson. Steve Pearson, sorry. No, 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 I can, I'm reading here, sorry. I see the ES in that. So uh, Steve Pearson, Vice President of Voting Systems, is responsible for all federal, international, and state certification testing. With more than 20 years of experience in system development, Steve joined ESNS in 2001. Mr. Pearson graduated from the University of Nebraska in Omaha with a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration with continuing studies in information technology. And last but not least is Brian Hancock, who leads our testing and certification program. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ed Smith to give the first um, remarks. And then, uh, Brian, if you want to talk about yourself a little bit more, because I don't have your bio in front of me, that's fine. So go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Uh, it's an honor to be here today, so thank you. I recall uh, being in the, one of the early certification meetings. It was June of 2006 in a conference room, not, not far from here, on New York Avenue, and uh, being handed a draft of the testing and certification program manual, uh, being there with my colleagues from the other system providers and manufacturers. And needless to say, the program has come a long way in the 10 years, and I congratulate the, the Commission on uh, maintaining and improving uh, the program to the magnitude that they have. Uh, I've personally taken a number of systems through the, the EAC, and when Commissioner Masterson worked uh, on the staff there, the, the EAC was among the first that I took through and, and since then. So I've seen a lot of, uh, of different types of equipment go through from a few different manufacturers, as the chair uh, mentioned a minute ago. And I found the, the staff in the testing and certification department under Mr. Hancock to, uh, to be uh, very competent. Uh, you've had a few people go through there over the years. They're willing to listen. And uh, most importantly, as, as I think we've heard today here, the watchword is change, and, and they're willing to change and, and adapt. And uh, I have to say for um, Director Hancock, as we know, for a time, the EAC was without a quorum of commissioners. Uh, it was under siege uh, at times, siege with a capital S, from uh, members of Congress and others who wanted to eliminate uh, the EAC and, uh, and move its functions under the Help America Vote Act to other players. And uh, Mr. Hancock, among other folks uh, who were department heads at the EAC at the time before your, your commissionerships, uh, did a great job of holding things together, keeping turnover uh, relatively to a minimum, especially in testing and certification, to uh, keep the mission of the EAC going. And during that time, there were systems that, in fact, were certified under uh, the quorumless uh, commission of those years. So uh, some kudos there for sure. Uh, the program continues to adapt. Uh, the program continues to be tougher. Uh, we've seen recent changes such as the test readiness review that raises the bar to even bring in a system to the program and to initiate its testing sequence within the program. Uh, we've seen in the current testing and program manual around scoring that if there are deficiencies found during test that someone like points on a driver's license, those can build up and, and get the system booted from the, the program that used to not be in there. And there's new hardware testing, even some fairly recent determinations uh, from the testing and certification staff around improving and enhancing the testing of uh, COTS hardware, uh, as well as custom hardware that's uh, in use in the voting system. All of those are in response to um, critiques and actual uh, results, uh, as well as some anecdotes, I think, from the testing and certification program and the actual administration of it. Uh, you know, with that, though, there's still work to do. There's always work to do, and, and continuous improvement is another watchword we have in elections these days. We, we see the continued and rapid implementation throughout the systems in the rest of the world, in and outside of elections, with commercial off-the-shelf products and seeing reduced cost, uh, reduced training needs, um, 
better support from players uh, in the computing industries and even in the commercial software uh, industries uh, like Google for Chrome, Mozilla for Firefox. Uh, we think of COTS sometimes as the printers and the computers and, and things, but there are also COTS software uh, the, that underlie the, the voting systems that are fielded and being fielded out there as well. I think that the, uh, the testing and certification program can continue to embrace uh, and even get out in front of jurisdictional use of COTS and, and desires for use of, of more COTS. Uh, there is an emergency procedure, for instance, in the uh, testing and certification program manual. But sometimes I know in my uh, walk through the industry, you hear sometimes that you know, patches, for instance, are not a paradigm in elections. Uh, they are in other parts of the, uh, the electronics industry. Where is there a happy medium? Is there some way to have what is now a, a very high bar to have an emergency certification with the EAC uh, to go somewhere in between that and while maintaining a solid configuration management, has some ability to make updates uh, a little more quickly, a little more easier than, than even the current modification process allows for. And of course, as has been mentioned earlier today, there's new standards in work, new VVSG uh, due out uh, in a few years. Uh, one of the things I had in my notes was the conflict that Ms. Bishop mentioned earlier, the, uh, the conflict, some people call it an alleged conflict, and I would agree with that, between security and usability. And although uh, Ms. Bishop's mind is, is made up and, and mine is too that you can have both, uh, I know of a lot of folks for whom that is not true. And so I am um, uh, glad that you guys haven't to referee that battle and not, not me. So um, as, as Commissioner McCormick mentioned earlier in closing, uh, I also see in my walk through the industry a lot of criticism by people who are not participating. And I think that's a shame. And I've spoken to it in one of the EAC symposiums you gave me at that time in the past, the honor of being on a panel. And I, and I spoke to people who were stuck in 2004, as there are people today that, that I hear from and, and speak to and see what they write that uh, are leveling criticisms against the testing and certification program that haven't been true since that first meeting in 2006. They're referring to programs that existed prior to the EAC's testing and certification program, or they're referring to things that have not been true in the EAC testing and certification program around uh, such things as code review that haven't been true for six or eight years. And so I invite anyone who wants to speak to what's going on with testing and certification, if you're not intimately involved in it, as myself and Mr. Pearson and, and Mr. Hancock, for example, to, to get involved and at, at minimum read the manual and, and see what is happening today with testing and certification because you'll find it's a very different animal than five years ago, eight years ago, and certainly ten years ago at its inception. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Pearson. Thank you, Chairman Hicks um, and the commissioners and Brian Hancock for the opportunity to address this topic. It's been near to dear, near and dear to my heart. Um, been with the SNS for 16 years and the last 12 years have, have been involved directly since the inception of the EAC in the federal test campaigns as well as state certifications as, as was previously mentioned. Um, fortunately and maybe unfortunately depending on which side of the, the table you sit on, I've been involved in this with these guys, uh, with uh, Commissioner Masterson, Brian Hancock and, and, and in those early days um, uh, Looking back at the retrospect here was the opportunity to do that. Those early days were uh, challenging and um, they'll remember some of the what I would call um, um, uh, very um, what would be the term magnificent debates that we were, were we had um, not only at the AC but with the labs and 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 I know ES and S uh, from a manufacturing standpoint. Um, it, but in those early days, um, the one thing that did come out of that is we all had the same goal, and we all had a lot of passion about what we do, and um, we all learned from that. So, um, and and from that, we've seen this program evolve into what I would say is a difference maker, and it's and I know from an ESNS perspective, it's made a tremendous um, difference in our company. Um, those early years, um, we submitted our first application for certification in March of 2007. 28 months later and two labs later, 
um, on July 21st of 2009, we received our first EAC uh, approval with our Unity 3200 release. Um, it's quite an accomplishment, right? I mean, I, I mean that was the challenge. Th those were the growing pains that we were all going through. And we spent um, a significant amount of money I, 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 um, in, in that two years um, getting to know the EAC, getting to understand the program, getting to understand the VVSG through their eyes, um, and the lab's eyes as opposed to just our eyes, um, and, and along with the rules of the new program. And, and I, the lesson learned from that was um, we had to take responsibility for the things that we could control. We had to quit fighting and arguing, and, um, and once we turned that corner, um, we solved that equation. Um, since that time, um, We've experienced a significant amount of success. Um, it, uh, we've, we've certified, uh, since that initial certification, we've had 13 additional federal certifications in that time frame, and we've just completed two more that are will be pending um, approval. We average, um, on, on average, about two federal EAC certifications a, a, a year. That's quite a bit better than one release every two years. Uh, now we're two releases every year. So that's that's a testament to the program. It's a testament to all the people that are participating in the program. It's matured immensely. Um, an example, you know, when I when I give the example, it took us 28 months to get through that first that first um, test campaign. We can bring a, a similar system in today um, and and accomplish that in six months at about 75 percent of the cost that the initial program costs us. So that, those are real dollars, those are real numbers, and the, the benefit of that is systems are getting to the field faster, the voters are getting to vote on newer technology and more secure and more accurate systems, you know, when we can have that kind of throughput in the, in the program. I can tell you without a doubt this program has made a difference in, in how we build our systems, test our systems, and implement our systems. And like I said, the states, the counties, the voters um, are, are the benef benefactors of that, of this program. ESNS, uh, we're, we're a supporter of the, of the EAC and this program, and, and we're better today because of it. Going forward, um, there's, there's uh, Brian asked us to at least give some thoughts on um, concerns or, and or um, opportunities for improvement. Um, you know, with the, the, the implementation of the new standards and, and the rollout of those standards, um, I think it's very important that we consider the number of systems that are in play today uh, under the, uh, the 1 0 standards. We're now working with three sets of standards. And, you know, I, di I didn't mention, but I do have some statistics on the number of elections that we've run since 2009. We, as a company, have run, um, let's see if I can find that number here real quick. Um, we've run 77,659 elections since that first certification. Um, that's 11,000, on average, 11,000 elections a year, and, and probably 70% of those elections this program touched in one way or another. Um, that, that's significant. And so when you think about the distribution base of these EAC certified systems, which are great systems, and we talked, we heard today about all the testimony about how how well the election went. It's a result of those systems coming through this program and being accurate, reliable, and secure. So as we roll out these new standards, it's important that we take into consideration all those systems that are out there today. They're good systems, and we need to be able to continue to make enhancements, improvements. Um, listen, we embrace, we embrace improvements in the, in the standards, in the technology, we have a commitment to our customers, we all do, to all those counties that are using those systems today to be able to maintain those systems until they can get to the newer, the newer systems. I think um, as we move forward, it, uh, the, the other key player in this are the labs. Um, we depend on the labs. And we, um, I think at a minimum we need to maintain three labs. Um, there is, there's more manufacturers now. We have more systems that we're bringing through because we still have the systems that are fielded today plus the newer systems that are coming out. Plus there's a growing um, need in, from a state standpoint for poll book certifications as well. So we need these labs. We need, we, um, and 
um, we need quality labs, and I and I think that that that's the key there. It's it's the three of us continuing to work together in a cohesive fashion. That's um, really my uh, the conclusion of of my testimony here. Um, we are a, like I mentioned earlier, we're a big supporter of this program, and you've really truly made a difference. And at ESNS, um, the systems today are so much better than they were 10, 15 years ago, and it's all attributed to this program. Thank you. Director Hancock. Thank you, Chairman. Commissioners, we certainly appreciate uh, the opportunity to discuss the program today and, and to hear from uh, some of uh, the manufacturers that, that we work with on a daily basis. Uh, it's always, always nice to see them again at, here at our offices. <laughs> um, and, and I Thank you. Uh, a lot of ways it seems like this, this whole process that we've been talking about uh, began only yesterday, even though we're, we're beginning our second decade uh, in existence. Um, the certification program, as you know, began 10 years ago this month when the EAC commissioners adopted the final version of the testing and certification program manual. Uh, because we had a statutory deadline for developing the first set of voluntary voting system guidelines, the EAC staff spent um, the first year or more, really, of our existence uh, working with the Technical Guidelines Development Committee and our partners at NIST to prepare that document for ultimate adoption in December of 2005. Once that happened, we then finally turned our task to solidifying our thoughts related to a certification program to actually use those guidelines that we adopted. Uh, much like any new program, the certification program had uh, a bit of a rocky start. Um, while we were trying to figure out solutions to problems uh, that would arise often on, on a daily basis. Um, um, we got these uh, solutions, we got these problems solved, uh, sometimes on the fly, but really most often with significant thought and intense internal discussion. Remember that this was the first time that the federal government was involved in voting system certification. We use bits and pieces from other federal organizations involved in product certification for examples and for guidance. But most of the details of what became the testing and certification program we know today were developed in-house. The success, or failure for that matter, of any organization or program is directly related to the people associated with that program. We've been fortunate enough to have some of the best and brightest minds in election administration pass through the EAC and con contribute to the certification program. I remember very well that day in 2005 that Carol Paquette, then acting director of the EAC, and I sat down in her office with a, a paper flip chart and began to outline and diagram the, the functions we thought were essential for the certification program. I also remember the endless hours that we sat with EAC general counsel Julie Hodgkins and associate general counsel Gavin Gilmore uh, while we discussed the legal implications of some of the things we were attempting to do, as well as issues related to the proprietary and confidential information um, that we deal with. Um, although heavy doses of caffeine were often needed to get through those debates, um, we always got through them with a, with a consensus on our path moving forward. Another frequent counselor on any number of issues related to public perception of the testing and certification program and the public rollout of the program was the uh, EAC's uh, communications director, Jeannie Layson, now Jeannie Schiffer. Jeannie really kept us focused on the big picture and on the potential impact decisions would have on all of our stakeholders, and, and so we thank her for that. The first true staff member um, of the Testing and Certification Division was Liza Otero. Liza was really a, kind of a master of all trades. She not only was really the heart and soul behind the first few years of the EAC certification efforts, but she somehow also found time to assist the, uh, with the EAC election management guidelines program and on the EAC's glossaries of election terminologies, which were at that time translated into six languages. Um, the next hire for our division was in many ways the most crucial because we brought in an election administrator from York County, Virginia named Robin Sargent who became the person that keeps me in line and keeps the office trains running on time, so to speak. The only downside is that Robin is really so good at her job that she's often pulled away to assist other folks in the EAC when we have big meetings uh, or big projects planned. 
Along the way, we were also able to save uh, a young man named Matt Masterson from a boring legal career of all things uh, <laughs> and hire him into what eventually became the deputy director position in the testing and certification program. Mr. Masterson decided uh, to go back home to Ohio one day to seek his fortune, and the rest, uh, as they say, is history. At this point, we knew uh, that we very much needed some additional skilled technical help in-house since none of us were actual computer engineers and since our part-time technical reviewers were very busy. To remedy this problem, we turned to our colleague Merle King uh, at the Center for Election Systems at Kennesaw State University. Merle informed us that he had at least two potential candidates on staff with him uh, that uh, might be helpful for us and that a number of other Kennesaw students might also be qualified and interested. Uh, we did a recruiting trip to Kennesaw and eventually hired computers engineers, computer engineers Joshua Franklin and uh, James Long. James and Josh became invaluable resources not only for their technical ability to review the work of the test labs, but also to assist us in developing uh, internal automated tools to make the program uh, run more smoothly and more efficiently. Just for a moment to get back to our part-time technical reviewers, the folks that made up that original team were able to bring us years of technical experience in a number of areas to really augment and professionalize our test plan and test report review. Their willingness to serve as part-time employees allowed us to take advantage of highly experienced specialists who would, frankly, uh, otherwise we would not have been able to afford under the, the government rate. Um, Stephen Berger, as you remember, was our resident hardware and accessibility expert. Tom Watson was our coding and programming expert. Tom Caddy served as our security expert. Mark Scall came to us from NIST uh, after, after retiring from NIST and served as our moral compass and testing and standards expert. And finally, my good friend Dawn Melhoff, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago, served to bring her perspective as a, a state voting ex system examiner uh, to our team. And of that original team, Tom Caddy and Tom Watson still work with us, and I certainly cherish their years of dedicated work uh, and friendship. In 2010, we were able once again to uh, add a key component to our staff when we hired Jessica Myers. Jess and her good work were familiar to us from her time in the Pennsylvania Secretary of the Commonwealth's office, uh, where she worked on Help America Vote Act issues and voting system certification. Jessica has provided our division not only with outstanding project management skills, but she's also served the entire EAC by initiating and expanding our EAC social media presence via Facebook and Twitter. Megan Dillon, Dillon was also with us as a computer engineer for a, for a short time. Uh, she filled in admirably when James Long and Josh Franklin left the AC to pursue other opportunities. And she also did a great job of maintaining and upgrading our internal database um, and helped the IEEE NIST process um, in developing and working on the ongoing common data format work. Um, in the past year, we made two new hires. In keeping with the theme of stealing valuable people from state offices, we hired Ryan Macias. And this really wasn't planned like this, I guarantee you. Uh, Ryan served in the California Secretary of State's office for a decade and, and had became really one of the leading state experts on voting systems um, and other technology issues as well. Because of his vast experience, Ryan didn't really miss a beat when he joined us and from day one was able to jump in and immediately show his value in test campaign management and almost everything else we do. Um, our most recent hire was Daniel Brandis, who has replaced Megan as our in-house computer engineer. Daniel is currently undergoing what we like to term a crash course in election administration uh, to augment his already uh, valuable computer skills and database skills. Um, as was already mentioned, the success of the program is also very much dependent on the skill and credibility of our test laboratories. For their continuing great service, we need to thank SLI Compliance, ProVNV Laboratories, and NTS Laboratories. We look forward to your continued support and for working uh, and to working with you all for uh, at least another decade. Last and by no means least, we need to thank our great colleagues in each and every state doing certification work. Although at times it, it may not seem like it, we always remember that certification in and of itself is not a goal. We're certifying systems so that states can approve them for use and that ultimately local jurisdictions can run their elections on the systems that we certify. 
So thank you once again for the opportunity to celebrate the wonderful people that have helped us through these past 10 years, um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Director Hitchcock. Uh, with that, we'll go with the first round of questions from Commissioner McCormick. I don't have any questions. I just want to thank you all for uh, 10 years of great work. It is amazing what you do on the budget we have. When you think about the federal government on all the testing that goes on in the federal government from the EPA, FDA, Department of Transportation, Department of Agriculture, the Interior, the DHS, I mean, you go on and on and on. And our budget is so, so, so tiny compared to what those agencies get for testing. And yet, it's testing of the mechanics of our democracy, which is foundational to everything we have. So uh, thank you for all the work that you've done over 10 years. Thank you to all of your staff. I want to thank the vendors. Uh, thank you for working with us. I want to thank the folks out there who are working uh, on innovating new systems, people like Dean Logan and, and Dana Beauvoir, uh, de Beauvoir and uh, some of the other folks out there who are working on, on some new ideas in uh, testing and certification and, and voting technology. Uh, so thank you all for your support. Thank you for all your work over the years. Uh, it's You're the reason we have uh, safe, secure, free, and fair elections. So thanks very much. Thank you. Commissioner Masterson. Sure, you want me to go next? You'll be brief. Uh, will I? <laughs> what more can I say about the testing and certification program now? Uh, I want to uh, – th this one's pretty personal to me. Uh, this was my first real job. I worked for Commissioner DiGregorio uh, for a time, but uh, Brian was nice enough to take a, a rogue lawyer from the University of Dayton School of Law in and allow him to help out with the testing certification program. And the conversation I had with you all uh, and with the laboratories and the technical reviewers sharing an office with Liza Otero, uh, I learned more in that time uh, that prepared me. Uh, for my career now than, than I could have ever imagined. So I, I owe a, a great debt of gratitude uh, to everyone that Brian already mentioned, uh, as well as our partners at NIST uh, and the work we've done with them to develop the standards, uh, the working group uh, work that we're doing now. Uh, you haven't lived until you've eaten at the NIST cafeteria. Uh, it's a treat unlike any other, uh, but the folks over there are amazing. Uh, they're wonderful people that, that we really, I think, enjoy and have grown uh, in partnership with. Uh, you know, they taught us some about technology and standards, and I think uh, we helped, uh, in conjunction with the TGDC members, educate them on uh, elections and the challenges that both the labs and, and vendors face. So um, I don't have questions except a hearty thank you uh, to everyone who, over the years, I interacted with. Uh, and, and thank you for mentioning Don. Uh, who I hadn't thought about. It was just her birthday, and uh, she yep. she sorely missed. Uh, she was she was incredible. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, Mr. Hancock, I thank you uh, for everything you've done uh, to make this program what it is. Uh, it's getting better. Um, I'm I'm glad to hear the manufacturers speak to the improvement to the systems as a result of the program. It's something I know, Mr. Pearson, you came into Ohio and testified to our, our board of voting machine examiners about. Uh, and we're only, you know, we're only going to get better. We're going to keep pushing uh, to improve both our process and, and your all systems and the laboratories that test them. So uh, I'll leave it at that uh, with a sincere thank you uh, and, and recognition of a job well done. I want to echo what my fellow commissioners have said about the testing and certification uh, program. I believe it's the largest group of individuals that we have at the EAC, and I believe that each and every one of them works um, particularly hard. Uh, in ensuring that the pr process remains strong and p pitches in um, as well. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I've asked Robin or Jess or Ryan to help me with uh, individual projects um, as I've moved forward with uh, tr m moving towards chair and, and um, trying to uh, help with the uh, agency myself. Um, I only have one individual question, and I've, you know, I've visited both of your facilities uh, in Massachusetts and in, in Omaha. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I would like to visit other um, uh, manufacturers, uh, you know, as, they, as, as time permits and, and as long as our general counsel says it's okay as well. Um, 
but also the the one question I do have is in terms of the last ten years, are there is there any improvements that you can recommend for the testing and certification program as we move forward with the new iteration of EBSG and as we move forward with the EAC in general? I guess I'll take that first. I do have one comment for, for the commissioners and, and for anybody who will listen. You know, I've, I'm on some of the public working groups and I've watched the, the conversations ebb and flow there. And there is one pernicious thing I see there that I'd like to alert you to and ask you to watch for and, and attempt to prevent, is that there's a small but vocal group of folks on those working groups, and, and some of them are not, on, some people that qualify under this are not in the working groups they, for re reasons that probably would become apparent through my remarks, just don't want to participate, and they're the people who just want to say no. There, there are folks who, for internet voting, for instance, which is a controversial topic, they don't even want to talk about it. They don't want to let the conversation go, much less consider um, testing of systems, implementations of systems, ultimately. They don't even want the conversation because they feel that that's a, a camel's nose getting into the tent. I've seen ideas raised on the public working groups that had merit and at least deserve discussion and, and just be squelched by uh, an individual's comments uh, back to those. And I, I ask the, the commissioners and the EAC as a whole to, to be on the watch for that and do what you can to prevent it. Uh, as, we, as was mentioned earlier today, whether it's tactical election operations up to setting these standards, which is, is a little more abstract and ethereal, conversation and communication leads to success. And so that is um, not necessarily an improvement per se, uh, but something that I've noticed lately that is concerning to me. Thank you. I echo um, what my colleague Ed has, has said, but I, I'm going to give a little bit different perspective too on some other issues. And I think um, coming through the maturation process of this program, I think the stability, we, we need to maintain stability more than anything. Um, if we have to go through radical change in the, in the program, in the process for testing, that'll set us back. Um, like we were set back originally when, when it took three years almost to get through a program that will happen again if if we lose the program we lose the stability and the staff the experienced people in in this this program I think that that's critical secondly I think um, uh, change is good allow time for the migration if there's changes in rules or interpretations of standards um, or uh, requirements and standards, those take time um, uh, to implement when you have such a broad base of systems that are already fielded in the system. So allow time for those to be rolled in uh, sufficiently. I think that's probably the biggest impact on, in the testing community is, and on the manufacturers is to be able to um, comply quickly enough with rapid change. That, that's a difficult task to do. Is that <laughs> exactly right? <laughs> <laughs> if I may build on, on Mr. Pearson's yeah. comment, one of the comments I've made to, to EAC staff, uh, I think present, but certainly past, is that if everyone, especially at the individual contributor level, involved in providing a system, and that's the person turning nuts, bolts, and screws on an assembly line to the most senior software developer and, and people in between and to the side of those folks, are not confident when they do their work that that work is acceptable, going to pass test and end up being a usable system to the jurisdictions, then there's a problem with your process. And, and at times that's, that's become a rather tenuous grip on reality as, as changes have come to pass that lead that, that touchstone I've laid out there not to be true. And that's not, not really a good thing. And I think that's one way to put what Mr. Pearson is, yeah. is saying through a lens that I, I've personally experienced. I, I did want to clarify something you said, Mr. Pearson. I promise it's just a yes or no. But you noted the initial time for the first system to get through, and now the time systems are getting through now, twice, two, two to three a year. And, and I just want to clarify, I guess, that ye yes or no, it's not as a result of the, the process lessening, but it's a result of you improving your products to raise to the level expected of the testing. Is that correct? 
Um, that is true, we, we, but it's it's also the approach that we've taken toward accepting the standards, accepting the program, and the the processes that, and the investment that our company has made in the testing prior to coming into certification. We have developed world class laboratories at, at ESNS um, that that we don't go into a certification hoping to pass. We know we will we will pass when we go into a federal certification now. So I think that's that's all been part of it. And I talked about accountability. We had to like point at ourselves and take responsibility for the things that we were resisting for so long. Um, that it, I, I can tell you that that has been the biggest difference maker from our perspective is 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 just taking ownership and accountability for those things that we can control. Um, the labs are better. Uh, the understanding of the requirements, the testing uh, requirements, they're clearer now than they were in the early days, and and um, the, uh, I think the the program's been stable. But when you know, as we go into this, that was my point going into these new standards, new program revisions, um, it, it will set us back a little bit. But um, I think that's all part of the evolution toward you know. Uh, emerging technologies, you know, greater security, greater usability, accessibility, and still maintain the uh, the reliability and the accuracy. The one thing I would caution, um, as there is pressure to move forward with emerging technologies, is that we don't lower the bar. The bar is is good where it's at, as you, and you're seeing it as a result of the ex tremendous elections that are being run around the entire country. Um, you know, it, in the, in the recent years as a result of this program. So that's the one thing we just need to all be cautious of. Comments? Well, I wanted to say that um, I really appreciate you folks coming in today. Um, there was a conference that I was supposed to attend in California um, the 17th, 18th of January that I'm really disappointed was canceled and it was going to talk about alternative voting methods for people with disabilities. But I believe that that's the reason why of people getting, um, thinking that this was about internet voting and so they wanted to put a quash on that. Um, I'm hoping that as this year goes on and my chairmanship ends that I'm still invited to some of these conferences to go and hear about these issues because I believe that um, when I worked in the House 15 years ago, um, these, these same comments were being made and we've not moved forward, but we've moved forward with technology and we've moved forward with security. It might not be great, uh, but we have to move forward with um, moving uh, elections, modernizing them. Um, and I want to thank Brian and Mr. Hancock for his team because uh, I think that they do an outstanding job. Um, and I hope that as we right size the EAC, we, we continue on with that. Um, I wanted to say that we want to allow the public to comment on the meeting and and uh, that's not to say that we want to get, be inundated with comments that are not uh, conducive to moving the ball forward. So we're going to leave the record open for, for 10 days and so that means that um, at December 30th we're going to close that and there's going to be a review of those comments and we will include those in, into the final record. Um, and with that, unless there's any sort of uh, additional comments, I want to um, close this meeting as adjourned. I but move to adjourn. Second. Second. Our next um, function will be January 12th as our uh, roundtable. And uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, ayes have it. And we are adjourned.